what made it such a large value that you wanted to I'm going to go ahead and start. Please. It was interesting. Uh, Jerome told me. Thank you all for coming today. I, it's great to see uh, not only faculty and students, but some, some old friends, some graduates, and the Culp family. I want to extend special welcome to you all for coming today. It was uh, just a day short of two years ago when we celebrated the life of Professor Jerome Culp in a memorial service in the law school library. Some of you may have remembered. It was, uh, we cleared out the entire library. It was seats all over the place. People were hanging from the mezzanine. It was, it was quite a crowd and quite a moving event attended by students and, and former students, faculty, staff, uh, and, and other members of the community, friends, some of Jerome's surrogate children. Uh, and, and many others. Um, we talked about uh, Jerome's love of Duke basketball, uh, Hawaii, <coughs> a Fanta orange soda, political and sports predictions, and of course, friends and family. Two days, two years later, we gather to honor and remember Jerome with a more academic event, a reflection <coughs> on racial justice in which he would have loved to have participated and in which his absence will be felt by all who knew him. Professor Trina Jones, who is back with us for, for this occasion from the University of Hawaii, where she's visiting this year, will moderate the panel, and, and I will let her introduce the panelists. After the panel, we will unveil a portrait of Jerome, which will hang upstairs uh, in, the, in the hall with the other uh, portraits. We will then hear uh, very brief uh, <coughs> remarks from some of Jerome's mm -hmm. colleagues and a member of his family. Immediately following the event, I hope you will join me at a reception in the loggia outside this classroom, which is being um, hosted by uh, members of the Black Law Students Association, who were also very helpful with the, with the promotion of this event and, and other, other aspects. Um, Professor Jones, I'm not going to give her an elaborate introduction. Uh, most of us know her. She's a, an expert on race her, herself. She teaches civil procedure, employment discrimination, and race theory. She was a great friend of Jerome's, and I'm delighted that she's able to be with us here today. It's such an honor to be here today on this occasion, not only to introduce the panel, but to have the opportunity to say a few words about Jerome. Professor Jerome Culp was passionate about racial justice. Given his brilliant mind, I have no doubt that Jerome was drawn to this area because of its intellectual complexity, a complexity that Jerome worked really hard to make sure that others saw. If Jerome were initiating this discussion today, I think there are many things that he would want us to remember, and I can only mention a few. One, Jerome would want us to remember that the pursuit of racial justice has never been and will never be one-dimensional, because racial identities are multifaceted and complicated by issues of class, gender, and sexuality. So too must be the quest for racial justice. Two. Jerome would want us to remember that just as there are differences within racial groups, there are also differences between racial groups. Consequently, the pursuit of racial justice must be sensitive to context and attentive to the ways in which African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, and groups that we don't even think about often, like indigenous Americans, are differently raced and erased. Three. Jerome would want us to remember that because racism is without borders, the pursuit of racial justice must be borderless. This fight must encompass not only North Carolina and Louisiana, but also places like Haiti, Sudan, South Africa, Brazil, New Zealand, Iraq, and yeah, even France. Finally, Jerome would want us to remember that although there are limits to what the law can do, we must press it to do all that it can. The legal and social challenges are formidable, especially as we lose the visible reminders and moral authority of persons like Coretta Scott King and Rosa Parks. Jerome would tell us that this, is not, that this does not mean that the pursuit of racial justice is futile. It merely requires steadfast commitment and a willingness to develop fresh, new, and innovative approaches to age-old problems. 
like all of you, I wish that Jerome were here today. As you can already tell, Jerome's powerful intellect made discussions of racial justice and injustice terrifically stimulating. But what made these discussions special was the fact that Jerome so obviously cared. For Jerome, discussions of racial justice were never abstract intellectual, an abstract intellectual exercise. These discussions were personal and they were real. One could feel this when he became really involved as his voice would take on the lyrical quality of a Baptist minister mm -hmm. and he would pump his fist and his gestures would become increasingly emphatic. In these moments, one could see a gifted scholar, but also a coal miner's son, a person who graced the halls of white privilege, but who never denied or tried to mask that he was a black man, a professor who was middle-aged, but who nonetheless cared deeply about the next generation. Jerome engaged the subject of racial justice with his head and with his heart. He always remembered that law is ultimately about real people and real lives. And it's in that spirit that we invite you to, enjoy, to join in today's discussion. The panelists need no extended introductions because they have all spent a significant amount of time within the corridors of Duke Law School. Professor Carla Holloway, who will speak first, is the William Rand Keenan Professor of English at Duke University. She recently received her Master's of Legal Studies from Duke Law and now holds a joint appointment with this law school. Professor Rank Rudy Cooper, our second speaker, is an associate professor of law at Suffolk University Law School and was one of Professor Culp's students, as was I. And last but not least, Professor Sandy Darity is the Carrie C. Bossimer Professor of Economics and an adjunct faculty professor in sociology at UNC Chapel Hill. He also serves as a research professor of public policy studies, African and African American studies, and economics at Duke. First, I'd like to thank Dean Bartlett and Professor Jones um, for extending this invitation to me and to express my regard and respect to the family of Professor Culp, um, whose presence, as you say, uh, hovers you know, knowingly over what we do. And I appreciate it um, and am a better person for having known him. Being asked to focus on matters of race and justice in this form, then, particularly important not only because we convene it as to mark a moment in the law school when its scholarly and collegial body was enriched and deepened by the intellectual presence of Professor Culp, but also because this is a moment in legal and cultural studies when the ways in which race matters and justice issues intersect have become, I think, especially complex. And so what I will offer in very general remarks for our conversation is a consideration of the way in which rights discourse has been critically influenced by a particular and historically U.S. construction of race, even as 21st century issues of race and culture have evolved into a more complex, I think, and nuanced terrain in terms of their material conditions and complications and the often contestatory and the competing politics that emerge. I also believe, of course, that future negotiations of these matters will be influenced by, of course, a very different Supreme Court. And so the political and social mediations of these issues will have outcomes that are significantly different from the structures many of us embrace and encourage today, especially in private institutions. So that said, Duke University is an interesting locale in which to engage these issues because of its history of, of institutional policies and practices that have attempted, and not without some backlash, to address its own institutional complicity in racial and specifically in black injustice. From its academic admission policies, the composition of its faculty bodies, to its hospital admissions, we have a history that has been tainted by a presumptive bias and stereotyped that limited our access and consequently, I would argue, our excellence. In the past, um, and in the re very recent past, we have specifically addressed that history of institutional policies and practices with things like Black Student Weekends, a Black Faculty Initiative, a Diversity Initiative, and the presence of officers in the university, in the hospital, and in the general administration 
whose oversight includes and is directed towards institutional equity and community relations. But as we understand that the history of racial justice in the U.S. has meant the availability, and I would argue the leak of this discourse and practice to other inequities, specifically those regarding ethnicity, sex, and gender biases, it would be disingenuous not to notice that the traditionally black-white stage of race has become more complicated and more textured that legal resolutions to these diverse matters regarding bias have developed what I think is a shared vocabulary in terms of judicial review and analysis only mirrors the way in which language and methodologies once focused on specifically black-white inequities have leaked into these comparatively newer dimensions of political and social notice of discrimination without, I think, a requisite attention to critical field distinctions in these vocabularies. So what do then shared structures and vocabularies of analysis mean in reference to discrete dimensions of inequity? Discriminations, for example, that are differently experienced um, based on Latino or black or first American or Asian populations, discriminations based on sexuality and those that extend from gender bias. Do our interests and our objectives in addressing injustice mean that our strategy ought to aggregate inequities? Or do we attend to each of these separately, focusing on a specific bias one day and another one the next? And especially, what does it mean that the bodies that are the subject and object of discrimination are themselves constituted differently and differently noticed than they might have been in the 20th century. Uh, frankly, I have an increasingly frustrated ambivalence regarding these issues. Um, and um, some would argue I contradict myself, but that's what Whitman said, therefore I contradict myself, I contain multitudes. Um, but there is one matter for which I can claim some certainty, and that is that our institutions have an even greater and more critical responsibility to educate us in the histories and the locations of injustice and its attendant complexities. Perhaps the most interesting terrain, because the issues are so dependent on the knotted intersections of cultural, legal, and ethical issues, is the dimension of science studies that explores the intersections of genomics and race. As a cultural studies scholar with some standing in some bioethics communities, my interests lead me to advise caution in how we understand and arguably privilege genomics regard of race without an attendant understanding of the social constructedness and consequence of race. This is already a contestable issue in medicine um, in terms of pharmaceuticals and a contradictory one in popular cultures in terms of what I call um, DNA capitalists searching for genetic ancestries. <laughs> and I suspect that our 21st century attention to rights and justice will need to be especially aware of and attentive to not only the ethical and legal and social implications, but the cultural nuances of public genomics. It's my sense that the legal or juridical categories of identity will find themselves increasingly challenged in part from the debate that extend from genomics concerning race identity and assignment, as well as the use of information, um, DNA, I mean specifically as evidence. And this may be an event that um, will come to remind some of us of debates in the 18th and 19th century regarding um, blood and bodies and the law. But this complex terrain reminds me that our contemporary landscape regarding the reign of normative values assigned to whiteness and sexuality had better be topics of research and conversation at both undergraduate, graduate, and professional school curricula if we are to be educated in the ways and means of social constructs and how they have become and are likely to remain critical negotiations in corporations, in medicine, and science studies, and in the law, especially as we have deep and resonant indicators that our cultural habit is to cultivate new biases as our global reach grows and our transnational impact deepens. 
So at this moment of honoring the scholarly interests and impacts of Professor Culp in this law school and with a portrait, let me just perform for just a quick moment the kind of work that might have a more familiar reception on my side, my other side of the campus. <laughs> I want to talk about gaze. His gaze outwards and ours towards the image need not be the only trace of his presence that echoes through these beautifully expanded hallways and techno-savvy classrooms. Instead, his gaze might operate as a signifier that acknowledges the textured difference race makes, the ways in which our understanding of the inequities tied to race and ethnicity adhere as we engage matters of gender and sexuality, and the institutional commitment and intellectual responsibility that we might claim with this portrait's reminder of the absent signifier, the difference, as Derrida might explain that without our focused and committed attention signifies an absence that we cannot afford to sustain. Despite Professor Culp's absence from our midst, and notwithstanding the surely to be elegant portrait, we have the commitment of educated folk to the issues that mattered to him, the matter in the that matter in the United States and globally, that fit precisely into the missions of this institution, and that testify as well to the occupations of educated persons who will claim itself as its graduates. Thank you. Hi, I am Frank Rudy Cooper. I am a 1995 graduate of Duke Law School and uh, was lucky enough to be one of Jerome's students and uh, especially lucky to be one of his mentees. Uh, Jerome is the reason that I am here today. Uh, Jerome told me when I was in law school, as I was saying to Professor Holloway, uh, that you can be a law professor. And I thought, well, that sounds like fun, but me? Why me? You know? um, and it was important that there was somebody here who would say those things. Um, and I just want to say a few things about sort of the changes that I've seen at Duke. Um, and then uh, talk a little bit about the Fourth Amendment and specifically about doctrine. Um, when I think about the uh, gaze that Jerome uh, will give to people uh, up in that hallway, I think about how we used to think about those paintings, that they were mm -hmm. the repeating white men, white man after white man after white man after white man. And what they said to those of us who didn't fit into that category was that our subject position just wasn't that valuable. Uh, now, of course, there are uh, complications with the idea of representation. But that doesn't mean that uh, representation doesn't matter in very concrete ways in our lives. Um, so I'm really <coughs> glad to see this change. Um, another change that I have noted, um, and this is one that a friend of mine from the class of 95 told me about, <coughs> is uh, uh, apparently the law school is overrun with queer boys these days. <laughs> uh, and this is uh, the happy report of a friend of mine who <laughs> sat with me over uh, at the campus center when we had a Cogley meeting. Um, and it was you know, uh, about eight of us sitting uh, at two tables. Um, outside of the campus center. Um, I think that change is also significant. And uh, just as Professor Jones has mentioned that race is uh, cross-cut with a lot of other identities, uh, certainly for Jerome and for many of us, it is uh, cross-cut with sexual orientation. Um, and we should never forget all of those ways in which race is cross-cut even as we focus on race. Having said that, uh, I'm really happy uh, to see all the changes here. I want to talk about a change that I think needs to be made in the law itself. Um, and that is that I think that we need to uh, push the Fourth Amendment back to where it was in 1967. Um, and that's always a sort of dubious proposition because I know that given our recent uh, appointees, that won't be happening. Um, and what do I mean by pushing it back to where it was in 1967? What I mean is that in 1967, the court thought of the Fourth Amendment 
and it looked at the language which says that there shall be no unreasonable searches and seizures and that no warrant shall issue without probable cause. And it thought that that mostly meant that in order for a search to be reasonable, there had to be probable cause for the search. Probable cause is a much higher standard than what we have now come to think of as the reasonableness standard. Mm -hmm. The reasonableness standard that was sort of invented in 1967 in the Camara case is simply a balancing. You weigh the government's interests versus the interests of citizens. Now, that kind of balancing seems very reasonable. Uh, on, but the problem is that it does not, in fact, acknowledge what historically was the purpose of the Fourth Amendment, which was precisely to handicap law enforcement in the United States, to make it harder to, conduct, to investigate crime. Um, now, the, uh, so in 1967, we had the sense that there had to be probable cause, and in particular, with respect to criminal cases. In 1968, we have the Terry versus Ohio case, and suddenly we say that even in a criminal case, there can be something less than probable cause which justifies a police officer interfering with a citizen on the street. Uh, the uh, Terry versus Ohio standard for reasonable suspicion says that as long as an officer has that reasonable suspicion that a crime may be afoot and that the individual may be involved, then the police officer can frisk, can stop the person, first of all, uh, and then can frisk them. And it's interesting to me in looking at the language that the court uh, talks about what a frisk is. A frisk is deemed to be a limited intrusion by the court. But the court defines a frisk as including the sensitive uh, tactile uh, manipulation of the area about the groin. Um, and I've seen frisks done on people in uh, neighborhoods on the street, and that is exactly what they do. They, uh, they grab people about the groin. And when we think about people being grabbed about the groin and that all that has to happen is that you have to have some reasonable suspicion that the crime may be afoot and that uh, this individual is involved, I fear that we have uh, gotten to a point where we've lost a sense that the Fourth Amendment is meant to handicap the police. What the court did in Terry versus Ohio was expand police powers. It said it's not, uh, it's too hard for you if you have to prove probable cause, so we're instead going to create this reasonable suspicion test and make it easier for you. Um, now, the problem with this, of course, in our culture is that when police officers have great discretion, we know that they tend to use it for racial profiling. Um, the uh, court in Terry versus Ohio acknowledged that there might be widespread harassment of racial minorities, but it said that it just couldn't address that. Uh, it seemed to me that there was, in fact, an alternative holding in Terry versus Ohio that would have addressed that. And that alternative holding was to say that, the court, that officers had to have probable cause and not just reasonable suspicion when they interfered with people on the street. It seems uh, that what the court has done is say that we should expand the discretion of police officers even though the court, in its own opinion, acknowledges that that discretion will likely be used to harass racial minorities. Uh, the, um, the court's opinion in suggesting that, it's, uh, that it can't do anything about racial harassment is really, in fact, um, I think, disingenuous. Um, because uh, that alternative holding did exist at the time. But let me sort of try and tie this together. Um, In lowering the standard, I think the court uh, creates a, a problem uh, that Jerome talked about, which is uh, the problem of how neutral standards can, in fact, uh, work themselves out such that white supremacy is what results. Uh, in this case, what we have are neutral standards that we know are going to be disproportionately utilized to uh, harass racial minorities, and yet, we go ahead and expand the discretion to do that. Uh, what I would like to see 
is uh, for the court to go back to its 1967 understanding that it takes probable cause and not just reasonable suspicion in order to, in order to interfere with people. Um, and uh, on that note, I just want to say that I'm really grateful um, to Jerome uh, for having um, helped me to see that this was an area that I could pursue. And uh, I also want to thank the law school for bringing me back here. And I'm very honored to be on this distinguished panel. I'd like to share uh, some thinking that I've done about affirmative action in a comparative cross-national context that's, to, to a large degree, a consequence of a set of raging debates that Jerome and I used to have over my kitchen table. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we frequently agreed, we frequently disagreed, but uh, uh, we always enjoyed the banter. Um, affirmative action constitutes a set of positive anti-discrimination measures intended to ensure access for members of groups who otherwise would be excluded or underrepresented in preferred positions in a society. It's intended as a strategy to address present day exclusion. It is not compensation for past discrimination, oppression, or injustice. It can function as a compensatory practice or offset for the effects of current racism or casteism. So affirmative action promotes access for the dispossessed, but it does not provide redress for their historic dispossession. Policies of reparations, in my view, are separate from affirmative action. In particular, affirmative action often functions as a means of desegregating elites. It does not operate to alter fundamental class characteristics of a society, nor does it operate as a general anti-poverty program. It operates to alter the demography of elites, to make elites more representative of the ethnic racial composition of the society as a whole. And characteristically, it takes two major forms, best delineated by Tom Weisskopf's useful distinction between preferential boost and quotas. Preferential boost add explicit or implicit points for being a member of a target group in a selection process. Quotas are fixed allotments designated for members of the target group. Elements of both approaches can be found in countries utilizing affirmative action. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. But one approach or the other usually dominates the system utilized in a specific country. For example, to the extent that affirmative action continues to be applied in the United States of America, it primarily takes the form of preferential boost, while in India and Brazil it primarily takes the forms of quotas. In Indian parlance, affirmative action is referred to as the reservation system. Both approaches can be predicated on a set of minimum qualifications or threshold criteria for members of the target group to be eligible for affirmative action consideration. So it need not and generally does not ignore qualification standards for the positions to which it is applied. The quota system provides a more concrete and unambiguous basis for assessing whether the goal of demographic transformation of a specific institution or entity is being achieved. A quota system also makes it more difficult to transfer the positions designated for members of the target group to others outside the target group, although this still can be a problem. India has the longest modern history of affirmative action of any countries currently officially practicing the policy. As early as the start of the 20th century, while India still was subjected to British colonial rule, three southern states of India established a policy of reserving positions in the state level civil service bureaucracy for the untouchables. So for example, one untouchable caste group, the Eleva, has availed themselves of affirmative action for close to five generations. Many of the younger Eleva contend that they no longer need the reservations policy, which may be true. It is noteworthy, however, that no peoples of modern African descent have had access to affirmative action for five generations, nor have the vast majority of India's untouchables and tribals. In 1948, a national policy of reservations for the untouchables or Dalits and tribals was written directly into the Indian constitution by B.R. Ambedkar, the brilliant Dalit leader. 
The political exigencies confronting India's Congress party, including the necessity of maintaining political support from the untouchables, who constituted upwards of 15% of India's population, led to circumstances where Ambedkar was positioned to write most of the constitution for the newly independent nation. Indian affirmative action establishes a total quota of 22.5%, 15% for the untouchables and 7.5% for tribals. Uh, the quotas apply to civil service positions, university student admissions, and faculty posts, and other institutions that receive public funds and parliamentary seats. Some of you may recall when uh, law professor Lani Guineer's ideas about group-based representational schemes were widely vilified when she was nominated to a high-level administrative post under the first Clinton administration. But in the absence of such schemes, underrepresentation of the dispossessed frequently becomes the norm. In the USA South, during the Jim Crow period, black political representation was virtually zero in state legislatures and in the National Congress because of black voter exclusion. The Indian scheme guarantees a threshold members, a number of Dalits and tribals in the legislative arena. Now, notably to this date, India does not apply affirmative action to employment in the private sector, although political pressure has been mounting in that direction. The United States, in contrast, has applied affirmative action in both the public and private sectors, albeit application in the private sector has been conditional on the size of the firm and its eligibility for federal or state government contracts. The intensity of its application has been contingent on the preferences and the political mission of the regime and authority and the circumscriptions imposed by judicial decisions. Affirmative action in the US has a much shorter history, dating from 1971, when the Nixon administration set goals and timetables to be administered by the US Department of Labor. Critics have made two central complaints about affirmative action. First, that the policy is unfair to the members of groups who are not targets for affirmative action. And second, that the policy lowers productivity and efficiency in the workplace. In the Indian context, Ambrose Pinto has demonstrated that the general process of obtaining higher marks on university examinations has been grossly biased against applicants from the Dalits and tribal groups who typically lack the income and resources for the special tutoring or the bribes that are used by higher caste students to guarantee their access. Pinto observes that more affluent higher caste students, regardless of their skills and with bare minimum qualifying marks, can gain admission to professional colleges by paying large capitation fees. He adds, universities and colleges churn out hundreds of graduates year after year without proper skills, and yet because these students possess wealth and status, they are able to enter the job markets due to the proximity they have to industrialists and businessmen. These are, after all, the very children of the landlords, bureaucrats, and industrialists. And as Ashwini Deshpande has concluded, the assumption that without affirmative action, merit is the sole criterion for hiring and admissions is false. Thus, in the absence of affirmative action, there would be preferential boost and quotas only for the existing higher caste elite, de facto informal affirmative action for the privileged. Furthermore, Pinto notes, the small number of young people of scheduled caste or scheduled tribal origin who manage to achieve high marks on qualifying exams still get excluded from employment consistent with their credentials in the absence of active affirmative action measures on their behalf. Bluntly put, discrimination persists. Now, in the United States, the most dramatic decline in estimates of discrimination against blacks, both in terms of occupational status and wages, took place between 1965 and 1975. This was the decade immediately following the passage of federal, federal civil rights legislation. Nevertheless, significant levels of discrimination persist, particularly discrimination directed against black males. Black men still incur 8 to 10 percent losses in measured occupational status and 12 to 15 percent losses in wages due to employment discrimination well into the first decade of the 21st century. In Brazil, a recent study using the 1996 PNAD to examine a sample of 57,000 male employed workers finds discriminatory losses in wages for mulattoes and blacks taken collectively on the order of 15 to 20 percent. Therefore, in neither the USA, nor Brazil, nor India, has affirmative action been sufficient in its scope or its implementation to eliminate discriminatory differentials in employment. Substantial gaps in labor market outcomes persist even after credentials, motivation, and work experience are taken into account. Consequently, it's not surprising that large numbers of non-blacks have 
not chosen to become black in the United States, nor have large numbers of high caste Hindus in India chosen to live the lives of the Dalits for the purpose of taking advantage of affirmative action programs in each of these countries. Now, two other notable cases of affirmative action merit discussion here, Malaysia and Northern Ireland. Since the native Malays constitute a numerical majority in a country with a parliamentary system, there is no particular need for them to establish quotas in the civil service or in the legislative arena. But their relatively depressed economic status led to adoption of affirmative action measures in colleges and universities and the adoption of subsidies for Bumatera owned businesses under the terms of the new economic policy of 1970. But the most unique aspect of the Malaysian program of affirmative action has been a scheme of wealth redistribution that apportions via state purchase shares of Malaysian corporations to a trust fund on behalf of the native Malays. In 1970, native Malays who constitute close to 60% of Malaysia's population owned a mere 2% of Malaysia's corporate wealth. By 1990, that share had risen to 20%. No democratically engineered racial redistribution of wealth of that magnitude has occurred anywhere else in the world. A necessary condition was the political majority status of the native Malays. Malaysia's wealth redistribution policy was intended to move the country toward closing the wealth gap between native Malays and Chinese Malaysians, but it was not intended to correct for or compensate for historic oppression visited upon the native Malays. Indeed, the most appropriate, appropriate target for such compensation would be Britain for its colonial practices in Malaysia. In this context, um, the case for affirmative action as anti-discrimination uh, is one that can be, uh, can be connected quite directly to uh, the notion of the functionality hypothesis as an explanation for variations in the degree of discrimination faced by members of a subaltern group. Uh, elsewhere, I described it as follows. A dominant group can seek to structure and control access to the credentials required for preferred, preferred positions to ensure admission to their own and to keep out members of the subaltern group. This could involve, for example, deprivation of subaltern group members of schooling, both in quantity and quality. In the rhetoric now popular in economics, the dominant group can take steps to influence the so-called pre-market characteristics of the members of the subaltern group to its disadvantage. But suppose some members of the subaltern group's pre-market characteristics become positive despite the obstacles set by the dominant group. Then the dominant group can take steps to include members of the subaltern group despite their qualifications. Indeed, as members of the subaltern group become more competitive for the preferred positions, the degree of outright discrimination exercised by the dominant group will intensify. Thus, in-market discrimination comes into greater play on a functional basis by a dominant group. It is used when exclusion on the basis of pre-market attributes no longer is sufficiently effective to maintain the color bar. So to the extent that affirmative action is used to desegregate elites, it becomes more difficult to do because, uh, because uh, it becomes more difficult to do if you're using class-based policies because it's the middle class of the subaltern group that's more likely to have the pool of individuals most able to enter and engage in elite positions immediately. Now, affirmative action in Northern Ireland, with fair participation standards that have to be met by employers for Catholics and Protestants, constitutes a mechanism for diffusing communal tension and violence there. By mandating that the composition of workforces be representative of the religious ethnic composition of the population as a whole, uh, many, many of these approaches or strategies of affirmative action in Northern Ireland, Ireland actually mitigate the degree of animosity between the groups. Affirmative action is sometimes charged with inflaming interethnic hostilities, but in the Northern Ireland context, it is seen as a way of reducing such hostilities. And it may be the case in a country like Guyana, which is deeply divided along ethnic lines between its Afro-Guyanese and Indo-Guyanese populations, affirmative action in the style of Northern Ireland may be worthy of consideration. Context is critical. Affirmative action is not always something that is politically divisive. Finally, we should be alert to tactics of evasion that have emerged in countries adopting affirmative action as well. In both India and the USA, steps have been taken to extend affirmative action beyond the original target groups in ways that dilute the benefit for the target group. For example, to other backward classes in India and to other minorities in the USA. The definition of the target group can be left sufficiently imprecise that previously unintended beneficiaries can replace the original target group. 
For example, in the USA, the use of the notion of blacks as the target group rather than Afro-descendants native to the USA has led colleges and universities disproportionately to admit students from black families who have newly immigrated to the USA from the African continent or from the Caribbean and count them as equivalent to African Americans. The rhetorical question this pattern raises is the following. Should affirmative action be used to provide a preferential boost for students whose families have chosen to voluntarily migrate to a racist society? Since affirmative action is an anti-discrimination technique, in principle, it should be applied to all persons who are likely to be subjected to discrimination. On the other hand, if reparations for slavery and Jim Crow practices in the USA were to be adopted, as I think they should, that should apply only to native blacks. Finally, note that it is sometimes argued that affirmative action stigmatizes the members of the recipient group, but it is their stigmatized status, independent of the presence of affirmative action, that has facilitated their exclusion from a representative share of the society's fruits. Hence, affirmative action is a corrective when exercised with force and effectiveness. It is a potential antidote for the effects of stigma rather than an essential source of stigma. Our goal as a panel was to just expose you to some of the ideas that uh, Jerome was drawn to. Carla talked about the complexity of identity and the changing nature of identity within the domestic context. Um, and Sandy, of course, talked about international perspectives and the importance of keeping these issues within an international and comparative frame. And then Frank, of course, grounded the discussion by talking about the Fourth Amendment and a very real issue uh, that affects African Americans every day. What we'd like to do now, because we were very good, as we were instructed to be, and kept this panel short, is to entertain a few questions. We have five minutes for perhaps two or three questions. Um, this question is to Mr. Darity, just on his last point um, about how Afro descendants should be given affirmative action while those immigrating here should not or maybe one could consider that they should No, I didn't say that. Yeah. I actually concluded the opposite. I said that reparations should only be given to afro descendants. Oh, okay. Well, then maybe my question is <laughs> Okay. I, I raised the rhetorical question and I answered it. <laughs> yes. Okay. To um, Mrs. Holloway. Initially, you made the point of uh, talking about the perspective that sometimes discrimination prevents us from excellence. But at the same time, how do you find the balance between the fact that, you know, where my grandmother would say everything that doesn't kill you would certainly make you strong? <laughs> and it, it, can you just speak to that aspect of it a little bit, given that African Americans are one of the most resilient cultures? I mean, how do you take that into consideration? I think for me it depends on where the we is located. So when I am specifically considering the history of Duke, um, being strong outside of Duke rather than being strong inside of Duke or as a member of, of this community presents two different um, situations. So my argument would be that unless we have access to the same spaces, then that resilience might just be a practice in group experience rather than one which, and, and I agree with you absolutely that that is the characteristic that um, I would use to most broadly um, articulate the experience of, of Africans in America. But until that experience is broadly diluted within the community, within all of our communities, the opportunities for others to experience that kind of excellence or resilience or other issues that might come up with more diverse communities is um, insular and therefore not available to a broader public terrain. My goal would be to see what happens to the terrain when race complicates the bodies that are in it. Thank you. Yes, David. Uh, is there time for the panel to respond more generally to the question how we should think about reparations? Um, I'm interested in what Professor uh, Darity had to say, and he touched on that subject, but I would also be interested in hearing what the panel thinks about how we should regard the question more generally. Frank? 
Uh, or not. I am in favor of reparations, absolutely. Uh, the question might be, uh, in what context are you going to, going to do what? And one possibility, although I don't think it's likely, would be to rethink some of the areas of the law that have been influenced by racial discrimination just as we try and uh, say that there is a, a need to start the race over even, that we might have to start some legal doctrines over even, because it's the assumptions that were built in at the beginning that often end up turning a neutral policy uh, into a racially disparate result. Um, let me say briefly, I think, although my memory is failing me as each day comes on. I think Sandy and I have argued about this before, but uh, it might just have been my imagination. Um, but, <laughs> but, but this is one of those issues that, that is complicated for me. He, he left in half of my family and the other half, the, the Nigerian half, were, were just left out of, of the reparations basket. Um, but yes. I think... <laughs> They, it was, they need you know, to talk to Britain. <laughs> but I think because, <laughs> and that's the comparative context, isn't it? Be, let, let me say first, because there's precedent for reparations, reparation in the United States, reparations is an absolutely appropriate objective and space for redress of grievance in, um, in terms of, of blacks who were enslaved. I'm caught into the mix of the operational methodology of this and the distinctions and the finer and finer distinctions which actually go to some of the complexities that I was talking about which might make reparations in the way that a popular culture would think of it almost unworkable. Although I do, I, I'm beginning to think we did have this argument because I, there, there are spaces where I think that reparations might work in terms of institutional reparation, but not in terms of individual, um, which would not let that family argument um, happen during a reunion, especially. <laughs> so institutionally, I think we may be able to address those. Um, and institutions, I'm thinking about things like historically black colleges and universities. Um, but even those are complicated and difficult terrains in terms of what the operation of that might be. So, but the, existent of the existence of the precedent for that in U.S. governmental policy makes it a, appropriate and, and, and a, an appropriate redress. Well, um well, first, I, I guess it might be useful if I say explicitly who I think should be eligible for reparations that are associated with the status of African Americans. And I think there are two criteria. Uh, the first is that uh, an individual would have to have an ancestor who had been enslaved in the United States. And the second is that the individual uh, for 10 years or more prior to the inauguration of the reparations program would have had to have self-identified as Negro, black, or colored so that you overcome the potential moral hazard problem of folks claiming to be black uh, just to have access to whatever the potential fruits are of the reparations program. And those years. two criteria, excuse me? 40 acres. Yeah. Well, <laughs> in, 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 in fact, one of the procedures that I've given some thought to as a, as a means for trying to calculate what the reparations bill ought to be is to think about the present day value of the monetary equivalent of 40 acres, which was a legal commitment that was made to the ex-slaves that was never executed because the law was abrogated by President Andrew Johnson. I perceive reparations as, uh, as achieving three goals. Uh, the first is acknowledgement, the second is redress, and the third is closure. And uh, when I uh, make mention of this notion of closure, this somewhat surprises people because uh, uh, other groups that have received reparations don't necessarily uh, commit themselves in advance to a position of closure. Uh, but by closure, I mean, uh, that 
an effective and functional program of reparations for African Americans would result in the, uh, the final social demand that African Americans would make collectively for a race-based program in the United States. Um, and I'd say that I, that would only be an acceptable final step in a reparations plan if that particular reparations plan was comprehensive and effective. Uh, redress is to try to examine, explore, and to overcome the web of inherited inequalities that persist along racial lines in the society, particularly uh, the most substantial economic disparity, which is the one that concerns wealth disparities. And wealth disparities are today largely attributable to two types of intergenerational transfers. So uh, people's wealth is, is generally not merit income. Uh, the two types of gen intergenerational transfers are inheritance and in vivo transfers. And if one were to really tackle the question of the racial wealth gulf, you would have to engage in a substantive racial redistribution of wealth uh, that bears some parallels to what was exercised in Malaysia. And acknowledgment, which was the first thing I mentioned, involves uh, the actual issuing of a formal recognition that a grievous injustice has been done, actually a series of injustices, because we're not just talking about slavery, but we're talking about virtually a century-long practice of apartheid in the United States under the form of the Jim Crow regime. And of course, there are still living victims of that regime. Of course, if we wait long enough, there won't be, but that's been the strategy in terms of addressing African-American claims for redress historically in this society. Uh, and I, I, there's also a whole package of ways we can think about the logistics of this. It's, it's not far flung. It can be done. Uh, it's been done for other groups, but it seems to never get done for African-Americans. Unfortunately, I think that we're going to have to end this discussion. I can actually hear Jerome at your dining room table, uh, mm -hmm. Sandy, saying, closure. What do you mean by closure? <laughs> closure is never possible. Uh, but unfortunately, it is possible for this uh, panel. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this brief exposure to uh, some of the ideas that so enriched our discussions and enriched this law school while Jerome was here. Thank you. <laughs>thank the panelists. Um, Jerome would have loved this panel. I know he loved all of you. He was a great friend and, and colleague. And I, I, could, I could also hear him getting engaged, uh, particularly as the uh, discussion about reparations was revving up. So thank you very much. Jerome Culp was a great mind, not the most disciplined mind in the world, but wonderfully creative, bold, insightful, uh, I think a, a genius in many senses of the term. He was a great colleague, not the most organized. His office was an unbelievable piece of work. <laughs> but no one was more generous, open, exuberant, and I don't think anybody was funnier. He was a great teacher. I will say that he never once came anywhere near close to getting his grades in on time. <laughs> But I think we have several witnesses here today. Um, I see John Keller, Bruce Rogers, Frank Cooper, who spoke earlier, who would tell us that there is no faculty member who was more accessible to students, more supportive, more challenging, in and out of class, and more willing to extend a hand to somebody who needed it. Jerome was a great friend. Sandy mentioned uh, his kitchen table. I never once actually knew him to show up for dinner on time. But once he got there, he was the life of the party. He was loyal and honest. He'd tell you how he saw it, whether you liked it or not. He was an original. Those of us who knew him will have our own ways of remembering Jerome. Today, we unveil a portrait that will show us what our current students and our future students, how they will see Jerome. And uh, after I uh, unveil the portrait, I'll have, ask Sarah Beal, John Weistart, uh, Jim Coleman, and then um, Jeff and Tom Culp to, to come up in that order.
Our dear friend and colleague Jerome Culp had so many characteristics that made him an incredibly important member of our community that I can't even mention them all in the brief time I have today. So I will just try to highlight a few that seem to me to have been among the most important. First, Jerome had a powerful and wide-ranging intellect. His views were enriched by his reading and his knowledge over an unusually wide range of fields. Truly, he seemed to be intellectually omnivorous. He had and he employed great rhetorical power to express his ideas and his vision in writing and perhaps even more orally. Uh, Trina made mention, and I think Kate did too, of how he would begin to rev up and be very powerful. And I only wish that I could match his rhetorical power today to paint a picture. He had abundant energy and the courage to stake out and to defend his positions. And he would have loved to have been on this panel today, and he would have powerfully mm -hmm. uh, stated his views. He took uncompromising positions, both in scholarly and political terms, and he stuck to his guns, even when he had a lot of opposition, even opposition from his dearest friends. And he also had almost irresistible charm and charisma. I suspect everyone who knows him can remember that twinkle in his eye and the way he'd sort of, you know, kind of look over at you. Just uh, I incredibly powerful. Finally, and most important to me, with Jerome, the law school whole was greater than the sum of its parts. He was the glue. He was the connector in so many different ways. Some of it was intellectual. He was a catalyst. I'll just give you a few examples. With another faculty member, he organized our very first Faculty Works in Progress series one summer. They sent out the notices, reserved rooms, bought bagels, and tried to attract hungry colleagues to come and comment on works in progress of others. He got various reading groups together to read and discuss things. I remember one, uh, it was one of Orlando Patterson's books. I think it was Freedom in the Making of Western Culture. So he got us all to order it, and then uh, he got us all to read it, and then we went to Kate and Chris's house to discuss it. I don't think he made the dinner. I think he got you to make the dinner, and I think he probably got someone else to order uh, the books. But he got us all thinking and discussing about it. So he was a catalyst in groups. He was also a catalyst for individuals. He loved books, and he loved to give them as gifts. And his choices tell you something about the breadth of his intellectual interests. For my birthday one year, he bought me a book that became one of my favorites. It was about the 1974 disco discovery of the skeleton called Lucy, technically mm -hmm. Australia Pythicus afarensis. And it was about that discovery, but even more, it was about the struggle within the discipline of anthropology to come to grips with and integrate new information that required completely rewriting the human family tree and how hard that was for a discipline to reorient itself and see the world in new light. Jerome was also a bridge between Duke's faculty and faculty at many different law schools, including our neighbors at UNC and law schools across the United States. A few days ago, I was at the University of Illinois, and a perfectly predictable thing happened. Someone came into my office and said, oh, I met you at Jerome Culp's house. <laughs> Uh, Jerome convened or joined groups for everything, and in so doing, he habitually and gracefully crossed all of the invisible boundaries that so often divide different groups within the law school, such as faculty or student or staff or spouse or child of the above. For example, he delighted in playing poker and basketball with faculty and students and spouses. He had election parties that involved people of all groups, uh, all of the above groups and others. He became one of the closest friends of the family members of many of his law school colleagues. When my husband needed to go to the emergency room, he placed two calls, one to Jerome and one to me. Jerome beat me home. <laughs> the husband of another colleague told me, Jerome was my best friend. I think that could be said for many of us. Jerome was our best friend. He read our work and gave us his own. He argued politics, legal theory, basketball. He was there for us and with us in a hundred different settings. He leaves a huge hole in the law school and in our hearts.
Jerome McChrystal Colt, Jr., friend, traveling companion, fellow son of a coal mining father, revealer of the truth, often the revealer of the uncomfortable truth, a person of humor, a person of intelligence, a person of dignity, and a person to whom I personally am having a hard time saying goodbye. The following are the words that I would offer in tribute to Jerome. I saw promise in the world, and I wrote to set it free. I saw promise in the world, and I taught to set it free. I saw promise in the world, and I gave my heart to set it free. How do I know that these things are true? Well, because I know Jerome. He was an integral part of my life individually. He was an integral part of my life with Denise. We greatly enjoyed the time we spent traveling to various Final Fours, having dinners in our house. I know that these things are true because I shared moments of great laughter with Jerome and moments of indescribable sorrow. Jerome was an extraordinary human being. Let me offer one example that gives us, I think, an important insight into Jerome. One of the great joys of teaching is the chance to enter the lives of students when they are unsteady on their feet and just learning to take the first steps into this discipline that's called the law. And an even greater joy is to see wonderful young people develop and mature and begin to run with the best of them in a legal world that frequently is not terribly kind. I've had many colleagues, and still do, who are wonderful mentors to students, and I hold those colleagues in great esteem. There is a special quality that I see in those whom Jerome has mentored. They are fiercely, fiercely loyal to him and now to their memory. He has gently but deeply etched their souls with truth about life and with truth about the world. They know that, and they want to make sure, and I would say properly so, that you and I know that as well. Much has happened around the country in the last two years to uh, remember Jerome, as you may know. Many of these things happened at the hands of former students. Others are the work of young professors whom Jerome has mentored. The uh, Jerome McChrystal Colt Jr. Memorial Lecture Series was inaugurated in Philadelphia. And there had been article after article in law reviews dedicated to Jerome. And I would say most importantly, dedicated with words of passion and vigor and compassion that confirm that we had in our midst a truly remarkable person. And then perhaps my favorite, uh, in October, about a year ago, there was a keynote, keynote speech at uh, George Washington University with, in my mind, the perfect title. It was A Call from Jerome. Uh, I read the title and it made me smile. Well, Jerome was a wonderful colleague in the building and was a, a tremendous presence in the corridor on the fourth floor. There was something very special about a call from Jerome when he had something on his mind. Uh, you could be assured, first of all, you were going to be there a while in this conversation. Uh, and you knew that you were going to move from hearing some just tremendously humorous observations about the foibles of our lives. And then you would hear that famous Jerome Culp air-pounding indignation about something a politician had said, or that the Supreme Court had said, or hold on to your seats, something that a coach at UNC had said. <laughs> but then there was also, in that same conversation as you moved from its various parts, there were incredibly perceptive insights into 
human behavior, and there were piercing criticisms of the myths of our society that make us cling to outmoded and often hurtful ideas. And mixed in all of that were glimpses of a breathtaking vision of how the world might be different. Now, for all of the casualness that Jerome could exude, he could be an extremely, and often was for me and for Denise, an extremely attentive friend. And we know, uh, as I've said, he was a wise and patient mentor. And he was a scholar who did the hard work to put his ideas down on paper, even when he knows that those ideas were not what a polite university or a polite society would like to receive. Jerome's influence across the country, I think, is uh, easy to document. The harder question is, harder question to ask internally, because we're so close to it, is did Jerome change this institution we know as Duke Law School? <clears throat> we measure that, and what we find is that this, would be a, this is a tremendous accomplishment for one person. Did he change the institution? I think there's no doubt that he did. Many of us, and again I would say that from a broad spectrum of beliefs and interests, see the world very differently today because Jerome was here and part of our lives. And I would say also that the institution has made important and sometimes very painful transitions because of what Jerome spoke and wrote. He has touched us, and we are different. I saw promise in the world, and I wrote to set it free. I saw promise in the world, and I taught to set it free. I saw promise in the world, and I gave my heart to set mm -hmm. it free. Thank you, Jerome. Mm -hmm. Jerome loved basketball. He loved to watch it, and he loved to play it. One of the earliest memories I have of Jerome is on the outdoor basketball courts across the street from here, near the basketball field, near the, near the baseball field. He was dressed in a blue Duke basketball t-shirt with gray Duke shorts and basketball sneakers with untied laces. <laughs> He had a basketball under his arm, and he was describing some jump shot he had made from the corner over a 6'3 defender, <laughs> or how he backed up some young hot shot to the basket and hit a soft fadeaway jumper to win the game. Jerome always performed better in his retelling of the game <laughs> <laughs> than he played in the actual game, <clears throat> but he did both with great passion. There was nothing like attending a basketball game with Jerome in Cameron Stadium. He would ease himself into a seat, sit bolt upright, and fold his arms across his chest. He then would deliver continuous analysis to all who sat around him. <laughs> he would second guess the coaches or anticipate by seconds their moves. He could spring up in an instant to acknowledge a spectacular play by either team and he kept close tabs on the referees, admitting when they got it right and berating them when they got it wrong. I thought about Jerome after the recent Florida State game. Late in the game, the official called a double technical foul on Sheldon Williams and on a Florida State player, mm -hmm. against whom Williams had retaliated after an intentional foul. This happened at a critical point in the game and may have affected the outcome. The next day, the Atlantic Coast Conference admitted that the referee should not have called the technical foul on the Florida State player. Jerome would have got that call right at the game right after the ref blew it. <laughs> he would have become animated and looked at whoever was sitting next to him straight in the eyes and said in an excited whisper, that shouldn't have been a foul on Florida State. The ref blew it. He blew it. That's how Jerome called the game. He was passionate 
with integrity. I can imagine driving down Science Drive in front of the law school building on some night in the future when Duke is playing in Cameron and looking up in the windows on the fourth floor where the portraits are hung and seeing in the shadows a large animated figure with a big heart and twinkling eyes dressed in a blue Duke basketball t-shirt, gray basketball shorts, and untied basketball shoes with the basketball under his arms, cheering for Duke, but calling it exactly like it is. Anybody knew my brother, you, you knew he loved the Steelers. He also loved Duke basketball. Those were probably his two favorite sports teams that he enjoyed. Um, growing up in Western PA in a small town, uh, you know, we, we grew up in a pretty strict environment. You know, and got my father here today. And uh, we didn't have grandparents. Our grandparents passed away when we were real young. And it just it took us a while. <clears throat> You know, you know, I was a kid, you always think about, let's go to grandparents' house and stuff. Well, we never had that. You know, we had to just do things around the house and stuff. So my dad had five boys. There's five boys and one girl. And the dad used to, uh, you know, just have us volunteer us to do different things. Didn't care if Jerome or my brother Jim or they had any kind of activities, like maybe go out with a girlfriend or something like that. He would just volunteer us. So Jerome didn't get a chance to have his own opinion when he was young because dad used to have the opinions for you. So I guess when he decided, you know, he got to law school, you know, now he can have his own opinions because he wasn't allowed when he was younger. Uh, but I just wanted to take this opportunity that, you know, when you don't have grandparents, then you have to have other family support. And just like it's here today, it was always here when we were young. And my uncle Lindy and Aunt Marva, my uncle Tommy, my Aunt Jean, uh, my Uncle James and my Aunt Jackie, uh, they're here. Just like they were always here for Jerome and for me, they were always here supporting us, always pushing us, always wanting us to do better, always wanting us to strive, always wanting us to be the best that we can be. And because of them, a lot of us have. And Jerome was able to come here and become a law professor for 20 years. You know, it's a, I uh, just wanted to honor them because if it wasn't for them, that's what helped push us there. And I just wanted to thank them. But you know, uh, the other thing I liked about Jerome, he, he loved life. Uh, he liked kids. You know, when he was a kid, he always talked about, I want to have 10 kids. Well, he didn't get married, so he didn't get to 10 kids. But you know, uh, my kids would come on the summers, and he would take them around and different things. and. My kids would just come home and say, Dad, Uncle Jerome is rich. I said, well, why is he rich? He says, well, we go out to eat every night. We go to the movies, you know, and, and just get it. He says, well, oh, got to be rich to be able to do all those things. You know, but, you know, if you don't got kids, you can treat your niece and your nephew. <laughs> so, you know, so their aspirations of Jerome was different than a lot of people. You know, they don't have things. So Jerome just loved life. We used to... I got to go to the Final Four with him, too, and he just loved the, the competition and, and his versatility. He was just a versatile guy. You know, he could talk politics, he could talk sports, you know, and he could just change at a dime and, and move on. And, and just and the best thing about him is, you know, he just loved life and loved to enjoy it. And I just want to just, you know, thank you. And I know he's smiling down because the Steelers won. So... <laughs> I'd never be here. Duke Law School. Heard about it all these years. Jerome told me to go back to school, that I could be a lawyer. Why would he tell a cop to go to school to be a lawyer? And I want to assure you, I've never used Terry 
as a means of racial profiling. <laughs> Uh, Jerome, when he was going to Harvard and was working in the summertime, he lived with me. When Jimmy was going to Princeton, he lived with me. And when Jeffrey was going to West Point, he lived with me. I was the halfway house between <laughs> Waynesburg, Pennsylvania, and the great eastern part of the country. And when you have three lawyers and one policeman, can you imagine these conversations? Uh, Search and seizure, cops. We had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. But um, Jerome taught me something too. Let me see. I guess it's 20 years, at least, when um, my town decided that I couldn't be a lieutenant. Jerome said, we're not taking this. <laughs> nope, we're not taking this. He broke up his class. He had them all work on my case. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what? Absolutely. We won. Absolutely. And let me tell you, I've been a pain in their ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank all of you for coming out. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all who spoke. I want to once again thank the family for coming. We really appreciate your presence here today. It means a lot to us. Um, we're adjourned to the, to the loggia where we will um, have some refreshment. Thank you. Thank you.